Welcome to a new tutorial. Actually, I haven't done a tutorial or programming video on Android in a long time. And I decided to make some Dagger 2 videos because it seems like there's a lot of confusion about Dagger 2, particularly in the context of Android. Uh, there's a lot of nuance and stuff people just don't seem to get. A lot of little gotchas, problems, and just in general, little things it's also a bit confusing when a lot of people don't understand dagger 2 and dependency injection in general uh, i find huge amounts of people don't just uh, understand what dependency injection actually is and what it means so this tutorial we're going to set up uh, dagger and see what we can do so dagger first off is not dependency injection a lot of people don't seem to understand this but dagger 2 is really just an annotation processor it's just a code generator and if any of you are familiar with annotation processors i'm sure you've come across them here if you look through my dependencies here you'll see a butter knife which is an annotation processor and there's loads of other ones as well and um, i won't run over annotation processors that's a separate topic but basically they generate code and people seem to think that dagger is a, how you do dependency injection it's not Dagger 2 is just a boilerplate generator, and I've said this already. Um, all Dagger 2, that's all Dagger 2 is. Dependency injection is something you code yourself. Good code is properly dependency injected. And really, the term has come a bit confusing because it seems to imply the usage of a library, but all they do is help you. So let's actually get stuck into it. Uh, We'll get Dagger set up and then we'll talk about what dependency injection is and isn't and how we can actually do things. So let's look at what dependency or let's look at Dagger setup. So first of all, we're using Dagger 2, which is the Google Dagger. I don't like using Dagger 1, it's not very good. Or I found it awful to use anyway. So uh, in order to use an annotation processor in Android, you need to do a little bit of setup in your Gradle. So the first thing you'll need to do is in your Gradle, I'm using the Android APT plugin. It's this class pad here. If you Google Android APT, it's on Bitbucket, you'll find it. It has instructions on how to set it up. So you add that to your build script dependencies. And then in your actual module Gradle file, you apply the APT plugin. And then you come down to your dependencies here and you'll see we have uh, com.google.dagger 2.6 is what we're using here. And then apt com.google.dagger dagger compiler 2.6. Um, so basically, the compile portion of this is the actual public API that Dagger sees. And it's only like six classes at the end of the day. The apt portion is the actual annotation processor, which will do the compiling itself. So this is what takes um, in that the annotation and stuff we mark. We'll see how this works generates the code and the generate code will get packaged with our application we don't want the uh, compiler itself packaged in our application because that's useful it's only used the compile time uh, if you've used butter knife you've already used this so we have the same thing with butter knife and butter knife compiler okay so that's the setup and a little bit of an introduction let's actually see what dependency injection is so if we come to our app here, we've got a basic application here. Uh, if anyone's wondering, it's a simple app. It just lists repositories from GitHub. Okay, so it's just a list of GitHub repo objects being published into these crude looking cards. Uh, as for libraries, we're using sort of a standard tool set of libraries. I'm using Retrofit 2. I'm using JSON. I'm using Picasso to load the images. I'm using OKHttp3 as my network transport, uh, which is what does everything. And I'm also using Butterknife. Now, a couple of people may notice that I have some a lot of Rx stuff in here. Uh, that's for future videos. So let's actually get some stuff going. So here's our activity. It's a basic activity. Let's get rid of the uh, emulator window there. So our activity is pretty basic. It's a standard bind view to get our list view. We have our GitHub service, which comes from Retrofit, which is our interface to our Retrofit service. 
Uh, we have a repos call for cancellation. We have our list adapter. And we have our standard in our on create. We're doing our network call. And on destroy, we're canceling our call. So you'll see here we make a call object and we call in queue. We have to need to call cancel so that we don't have it trying to set data on after rotations and stuff like that. So we handle all that kind of crap. Okay. So we have all that working and that's great. Well, where is the GitHub service coming from? And for that, we have our application class. So this is our GitHub service. We create a retrofit, we create our JSON, uh, we hook everything up. That's okay. Thing is, I'm not really happy with this. A lot of room for improvement here, and particularly in terms of network efficiency. So one thing we can do is, you'll notice here we have, uh, we're using Picasso. I'll just bring up a list item. So we're using Picasso uh, with context. Now, Picasso is a great library. However, Picasso by default will not use OKHTTP3. But we want to use that library. We want Picasso and Retrofit to be communicating on the same library. We also want to add logging uh, to OKHTTP3 so we can see what URLs we're hitting and how we're downloading all this stuff. So let's code that up. Well, we need to create an uh, OK HTTP3 client. Standard stuff. We're going to set that on our retrofit. So client, OK HTTP client. So that's our retrofit setup. Um, oh, we want to do logging. Well, we're going to need to just, uh, oh, we'll need to do a builder here, actually. So new OK builder dot uh, build. And then in here, we want to say dot add interceptor. Okay, we need the logging interceptor. So let's create that up here. Uh, logging, oh, it's called HTTP logging interceptor. Uh, HTTP logging interceptor. And then we want a new logger where we do logging. Um, I also want to use timber. Do I have timber here? I do not have timber. I wanted to use timber because I really like that library. Uh, let's just get the timber library. So we're going to need to bring up a browser. And uh, we're going to go to, uh, say, Android timber. That's another Jake Wharton library. What do you know? A lot of libraries that guy has made. Um, and a lot of, well, not really him, the square guys make a lot of libraries. So we'll just add timber to our compile step. Uh, we'll just sync our project so we pull down the latest dependency of timber. I love Maven that way. So we need to say, uh, let's see, timber.plant new debug tree. And then we want to say, uh, timber.log I'll say dot i and our message okay great so this is all set up so now we need to add our interceptor so we can see the clients passing by let's create our Picasso instant and new Picasso dot builder and we need our context which is this Build and then we need to say not dot downloader new OK3 downloader and then we have our OK HTTP client. So this is all set up now. I've just wrote a big pile of boilerplate for a start, but this is all going to have to be written one way or another. Now, if anyone is will notice here is that we've only done some very basic stuff. We've created Picasso, our GitHub service, our retrofit. We've set up our timber, we've done a lot, all the kind of standard stuff in here. The problem is we've got an awful lot of classes and an awful lot of code in here just to set this up. And this is just network. So now let's set up uh, Picasso to become, make this accessible. Now I could say, I think you say Picasso dot set singleton instance Picasso, okay? I know you can do this, we're not going to do that. We're going to do this properly. So in terms of dependency injection, what's the correct way to do this? You'll notice here I'm calling Picasso.withContext. 
and we've got these repo list items here. So this is where uh, what dependency injection actually is comes into play. And this is why people get confused. I'm going to look at this class and I'm going to say, what does this class depend on? Well, it depends on a context. It's the only thing required to make a class. An instance is a context or any of these other opportunities. In fact, we'll get rid of all these. We don't need them for this use case. Now, you'll notice that that's OK. That works. We'll get rid of this init method. It's not doing anything anyway. The problem is uh, this list item is secretly depending on Picasso being here, doesn't it? Look at this, Picasso that with context. It's secretly got a dependency on it. Now that's not a good situation to be in, in terms of code. Because let's say I go to test this class. Okay, you go to test it, you create your instance and you test it. Oh fuck, Picasso's not mocked or something everything flies out the window. This is what dependency injection essentially is. It's adding constructor arguments. It's constructing your code in such a way that you can use constructor arguments to pass in what each class needs to work. And from that, you can build a dependency tree. So we're going to add Picasso here, okay? As an instance, not a lot of people do this. And we're going to have our Picasso instance now Unfortunately, Android likes to yell if you're missing certain view constructors. Um, this view is being used as a list item, by the way. It's not being used as an actual view view in an Android layout. So we can get away with just having we can or we can get away with having uh, custom constructors, which is great as long as we pass the context up to the super. So now we've got our Picasso instance. Now you'll notice this has become. Hmm, I won't format the place. You'll notice that uh, this whole situation has become much better. Because now, Picasso is part of our constructor, which means that it's clearly telling us when we go to create an instance of this class, Picasso is a required dependency. And that's what dependency injection actually is. That's it. It's using the constructor. Now, there's a couple of other methods of dependency injection. Personally, if you're not using the constructor and you require other methods, uh, unless it's a unique case, if it's in your own code, you're doing something wrong. Everything should be structured correctly. Uh, the unique case is activities because you can't have constructors for activities or fragments or services. Therefore, you have to use what's called field injection or method injection. But we'll use field injection when we get to that point. So this is great. So. Where does this Picasso instance come from? Let's look at our home activity and look at our adapter. Our adapter is complaining we don't have a Picasso instance. So this needs to have Picasso. And we'll create a field. And then we'll put that in here. Great, we have our Picasso instance. Now our adapter needs it. Well, you know, we'll have to create another Picasso instance, I suppose. So up here next to our Git observers, we're going to go Picasso. Picasso. And that's OK. But where do we get this from? We need to initialize this somewhere. So it just moves up here. So, well, we have this application method here that's getting an instance of application from the get application call. Well, we'll add a new method in here, um, you know, get Picasso. And of course, we'll have to um, make this into a field. So we'll just split this into declaration and assignment, move it up here, make it private because we don't want anyone stealing this uh, without our permission. If you think that's unlikely, widely code on a team. It's horrifying. So then our home activity, we can say, you know, uh, Picasso is equal to get Picasso. This is all great. In case you're wondering here, um, we are using the GitHub application to initialize all our app-wide dependencies. So this is uh, this will come into play later when we talk about scopes. But this is our basic setup. We have our dependencies. So we've got a nice dependency tree here. If you actually draw this tree, if you draw an actual tree graph, you'll be able to see this very easily. But in fact, I should be able to get. Uh, directed acrylic graph is what it's called. Yeah. 
So I'm just going to load up an image into Studio so you can see that. Okay, it's not working. Basically, when you structure all your dependencies together, bit by bit by bit, uh, when you structure your dependencies and draw out what depends on what, so each node is an item, we'll get a nice sort of tree structure. So I'm actually gonna do this in some comments here because I really need you to see this. So what's our top level thing? Well, our top level thing is our, uh, what is that the highest uh, thing that we need? Well, it's our activity. Activity, which depends on, if we go down here, I have spelled activity wrong, I'm like an idiot. Uh, which, what's that require on our uh, retrofit? And Picasso. Which do both depend on, okay, HTTP. Which, if we, uh, have, has a logger. Uh, okay, HTTP, actually we have, we've missed something I want to add. We want to add a cache. Uh, and then to cache resources when necessary, because OKCP doesn't do that by default, which needs a file. Uh, we've got our logger. Our logger requires timber underneath it. Um, OKCP also has an interceptor. Oh, that's our logger, yeah. The uh, retrofit requires JSON. So as you can see, things start getting out of control quickly. This is only for basic networking. Imagine if you've got a big application and you've got about seven network clients all working in parallel. So actually I missed something there. Our GitHub service is what our activity depends on. And the GitHub and Picasso and the retrofit depends on that. So if we draw lines on this graph, we've got activity to GitHub service, to retrofit, to OKHTTP, and to JSON, uh, which goes to logger, which goes to timber, and then we've got the cache and the file and Picasso, which also talks to this and talks to this and talks to this. We've got classes everywhere. We've got instances flying around. This is a trivial example, but you can see how quickly it flies apart. In fact, this isn't actually quite accurate. Picasso has the OKHTTP3 downloader, which depends on this. So we've got this big dependency structure. Imagine, a, like I said before, imagine a big application where you've got six or seven network clients. You've got some kind of, um, let's say you've got logins, you've got some kind of class, a manager, let's say a, an authentication manager to manage authentication. You've got activity starting and going up, closing and shutting up and down. You've got, um, if you're using MVP, you've got presenters and stuff as well. You've got context and you've all this dependency structure and it gets very messy very fast. You don't even want to see some of the server stuff. Some of the server stuff, you've got your, your re repository, which is your Spring Data Mongo, which is just a database access, and then sitting in front of that, you've got your caching layer, and in front of that, you've got your manager layer, which has multiple repositories and caching, and then you've got your um, interaction layer, and then you've got your, your controllers, and then you've got this, and you end up with this big sort of chain of dependencies. This is why we use things like Dagger or Juice, or Dagger 1, or Dagger 2, as I mentioned, um, or Spring Injection, Spring Dependency Injection. This is why these ex these tools exist. It's essentially to get rid of this boilerplate. Imagine we had 50 objects to create in here and manage throughout the lifecycle of the application and all their dependencies. The code would turn into spaghetti. And it will. It's going to go all over the place. This is why Dagger works, because Dagger will generate this code for us. All we need to do is say, this is my class, this is how to create this class, this is the instance you will get, and Dagger draws all the lines. So in the next video, I'm gonna cut it off here guys, the next video will actually go through setting up our application stuff for Dagger. Yay.